Before that, strange encounters with Esther. Today we have people who've met aliens from outer space. In fact, some have been kidnapped by them. They've had strange operations carried out by them on their bodies. Now, at this point, you're sitting at home saying, I don't believe a word of this. Well, have a look at this. This is a medical report. It's by a doctor in the Accident and Emergency Centre of West Hill Hospital in Kent. And on it, there's a list of injuries. And underneath the list, the doctor writes, I can find no logical cause for these injuries. Maria Ward, this is your medical report. It is. What do you say caused these injuries? Well, that particular occasion, I was awoken early hours of the morning, about quarter past three, uh, at my home. Uh, there was lots of lights outside the house. Um, I got out of bed and looked out the window, and there was all these lights just sort of moving around. Um, cutting a, a long story rather shorter, um, I ended up outside of the house and I was moving upward in this light and I could see the top of the house. Were you awake or asleep? I was absolutely totally awake because at one point I'd walked around the bed and tried to wake my son up who was asleep in the bed next to me and I was really slapping him, you know, trying to wake him up. Um, the lights in the house had actually all gone out. The only light was from these lights outside the house. Um, and there I am moving upward and I'm, I'm seeing the top of my house and I'm seeing the tree in the garden. I saw a tennis ball stuck in the guttering, which we later had removed because I'd seen it that night. Um, I then found myself in, it was a, a small place, um, very solid, very real, physically real. Spaceship? I don't know, I couldn't tell you. I don't, it's not a term I would use. I was in a real place. Um, it was very bright and when the lights dimmed down, I could see shadows moving around, hear shuffling feet, like children in a gym, like little bare feet sounds. And there, standing in front of me, were what I would describe as three non-human beings. What did they look like? They were about three and a half to four feet tall, uh, sort of tan brown, grey in colour, very big eyes, long arms, long skinny legs. They looked like undeveloped children. Mm -hmm. um, and they walked forward, um, and then I found myself following them around this corridor. But this is a, a, this is a list of injuries. They hurt yeah. you. Well, um, later on, uh, as I said, we walked around this corridor and I ended up in a large room, about 30 foot in diameter, and I was made to lie down on a central table. It was like a platform. And once I was laying down on this table, um, the two other, there were two other taller beings. They're exactly the same, but a slightly different colour. They were more of a whitey-grey colour. And I had um, like a, a sort of probe thing, sort of right along my arms and down my body and where that touched me you could see right through the skin and see my veins and the following after the experience just an hour later I had all bruises already fading where this thing had touched me I had uh, another device stuck into my little finger and had the nail cut off on the little finger I had um, they were taking samples of you I suspect, I mean, now it seems that way. It seems like some type of medical examination. That's the only thing I can equate it to. I had hair removed from the back of my head. I had a needle placed actually into my head, which caused me a considerable amount of pain. And these are all the, the list of injuries. Hair mm. seems to be taken from the root, etc. Yeah, I had something placed up my nose as well, which I, I thought when this thing was placed up my nose, it was like a long glass tube. I mean, How the injuries soon after this experience did you go to the hospital? And get I went this? to see my doctor... Um, two days afterwards and then he recommended that if the, the discomforts that I was having, uh, like the pain in my head and what have you, continued, I should go and see a doctor. And as it was, because it was the weekend, I, I had to go to a casualty unit. So you went to casualty. Mm. Well, we'll come back to this medical certificate and these injuries in a moment. Let me just uh, see how the audience is responding so far. Who believes this? Do we, do we, are we convinced by this? <laughs> yes. There's a lot of people here that are. Suppose this lady came up to you, sir, and told you this story. Would you believe it? No, not at all. Um, but I would actually point to a one-to-one so -one correlation between what she's experienced and religious visions. If you actually uh -huh. look at what people have in religious visions, they are spirited up, they see bright lights, 
um, the figure that she described, which is a short one, hairless, broad head, wide eyes, is an absolutely archetypal figure from mythology, from demonology, in fact. So um, could it have been the influence of some religious vision or something that you had no, read about? I mean, I, I, A, I'm not a fantasy-prone person. I'm not a deeply religious person. I mean, I, I have beliefs, but they're nothing that take over my life. Um, and what, what, as I say, what I experienced was absolutely real to me. Let me just uh, talk to these two ladies, because you too have had some sort of alien encounter, haven't you? Tell us about it. Very similar, except that we were travelling home along the stretch of road we did regularly. In um, a car? Uh, yes, so there was three of us. It was night time, and as we rounded a bend in the road, there was these lights in front of us. Now, the lights were very bright, and you could actually see that um, the object was round or oval, depending on how you were looking at it. A spaceship thing? It was an, a UFO. We had never seen anything like it before. There was four very bright white lights, one at each compass point, and two red lights in the centre. And it was... Round? Of, yeah, well, round oval, as I said. If you're looking at it from an angle, it's difficult to say whether it's round or oval. But it was definitely that shape. You saw the thing at the same time? Yes, yeah, saw all three of us same, saw, saw the same thing. Yeah. You hadn't been drinking? Or? No. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> no? You've never seen this sort of thing before? Never. No. No. Uh, did anything get out of it or talk to no, you? No, the or? car... Um, Vivian, who was driving, tried to speed away from it because we were absolutely terrified. Yes. Um, but very excited as well, but absolutely terrified. Um, she put her foot on the accelerator and the car lost power. Um, at which point the object was then in a field next to us and Valerie and myself were watching it out of the side window. We have no recollection of it going from A to B, from being in the road in front of us to being in the field next to us. It just sort of zapped there. Well, we, all we remember, that was our conscious memory, is seeing the lights, then following it down the road, very, as I said, Vivian desperately trying to get the car to respond to her. And then, um, some way down the road, the lights dimmed as if it was taking a surge of power, and it had gone, and at which point the car picked up speed. It and you thought to yourself, who can we possibly tell? Well, that's right. Because there was three of us. If there'd only been one, I would never have said anything at all, personally. No. But because there was three of us, then we felt... And do people believe you? Some. some, yeah, <laughs> some <not. laughs> we take a lot of uh, ridicule, but you get used to it. Mm -hmm. Now, think how bad it would be if you were a policeman. We have in our studio a policeman who had a not dissimilar experience, didn't you, sir? You, you're not a policeman anymore. No, I'm retired now. Uh, what I, I've listened to the lady, I've listened to this young lady here. My experience was that uh, approximately in 1980, I, with other police officers, uh, came across a, a UFO actually down on the ground actually blocking the main road. Anything like you've heard described? Um, mine was about 20 feet wide, about 14 feet high. It was diamond shaped. Red was, lights? There was no lights to, on it. It was just rotating in the middle of the road. Did it zap anywhere? No, the trees at the side were shaking violently, as was the bushes. Now, what this was you, real. This was a real thing. This wasn't a imagination. This wasn't lights in the sky. This was solid nuts and bolts. Now, I, I put the blue beacon on, the flashing warning light, and they reflected off it. It was real. It was solid. It left debris on the road. I don't know what it was, and up to this day, nobody's explained to me exactly what it was. Did you see any aliens of any kind? No, not consciously, no. Uh, at the time, I didn't see anything other than the object. Right. Approximately 12 months later, I went under hypnotic regression because there was a time lapse. And during un under hypnosis, I do come out with a very similar story to this young lady here. Right, now we better explain hypnotic regression. That's when you get hypnotised, go into a trance and remember things your mind has otherwise blocked. Is that right? Well, that's what I'm led to believe it does, yes. And what did you remember? Uh, I've seen the videotapes of me under hypnosis and they're very frightening for me to watch them. Why? Because I come out with a story that I find very difficult <laughs> to believe. You can't believe yourself when you I, hear yourself I telling. find it very difficult to believe that I've actually saying what I'm saying, that, I've, that I get taken aboard the craft, I get medically examined uh, by little creatures that she's described, by the tall guy. Uh, I had burn marks on my foot. Uh, and it's very difficult to accept something like that. And, and this you only remembered under hypnosis? I, I can only remember it under hypnotic regression, yeah. I have no conscious memory even today of it. The only reason I can tell you about it is because I've seen myself say it on videotape. Well, let me just ask Dr. James Thompson, how can one explain this sort of 
hypnotic memory of, uh, of, of such events? Well, first of all, <clears throat> there's no evidence that under hypnosis you can remember things which you can't remember in other ways. There's nothing which you can get from hypnosis you can't get from other techniques. And that's a very important finding. The one thing that also shows up from hypnotic techniques is you get more bad data, more confused data. So as a technique for getting people to remember things, it's one of the worst techniques available. Maria, were you regressed? I've never had hypnotic regression simply because for the skeptics, regression is a controversial area. Um, and I've tried to remain objective about my own experience. And I don't, I, well, to date, I haven't found anyone that I would consider objective enough in order to hypnotize me, let's say, to find the missing blank spots of other experiences I've had since that one. Were you hypnotized? Yes, we were, because we'd lost time. Um, the journey actually took longer than it should have done. And what did you remember or think you remember um, under hypnosis? Very similar to, to what Maria said. Uh, I remember the shuffling feet under hypnosis. That was a, a big thing. Um, similar things to the she's described, the, the three to four foot um, things that weren't actually humanoid or anything like that, more like robots. Taking bits of you? No. Um, Vivian actually claims to have been examined under hypnosis. Um, we had a different experience. So they just shuffled around and then left you alone? They lo looked at us, they, they uh, took us into a room where we were put into some sort of machine. But this is all under hypnosis. I this see. is what we've learned under hypnosis. I'm afraid, I mean... It, it doesn't, I mean, even, like, the same as Alan Godfrey's just said, it's difficult for us to believe, so we don't expect other people to believe it, because it's, you know, it's something that you just think, you know, this actually happened. Now, Harry Harris, you've, yes. you've made a study of this, yes. of these stories. Uh, in, in fact, fact yes. you've... you've I, made a study of this sort of regression. Yes, I in fact arranged the hypnotic regression experiments of Rosemary and Valerie and right. Alan and several other people in this room. Yeah. <coughs> when we have the people hypnotised, they are regressed back to events prior to the sighting. Under hypnosis, their accounts under hypnosis are the same. They don't vary, but they fill in under hypnosis the missing time. Now, it's the only tool we had available without using hypnosis. This data, this part of the experience would not have come to light. We wouldn't be having this conversation, this programme tonight. You see, the problem is, no disrespect to my friend here, he's being asked to comment on experiments that he wasn't present at ab about people whom he's never met. I'm, I'm probably closer to it than anybody else in this room, apart from the witnesses themselves. What do you Alison, say to this? Well, let's let's, let's, just, just, go to, let's just go to simple facts about whether you can do memory experiments and whether you can show that under hypnosis people remember things they couldn't otherwise remember. And there's simply no evidence of that. Now, Mel Grant, you've hypnotised people, is that right? That's true, yes. Now, uh, what, what do you think about all this? Well, listening to the doctor, I, I, I suspect he doesn't know really what he's talking about. As far as it goes... <laughs> Over the years, I've met numerous people who have been abducted. There is a method methodology to so it. So you believe this? Oh, yes, by, by all means. I've, I've regressed many, many people with the stories. But Mel, Mel, let me just ask you a question. All these people who are regressed and abducted, do they have the same sort of shuffling feet and people with skinny the legs? The basic elements of an abduction yes. are always the same. Yes. Um, what happens is that I do this to get to the facts. I'm not interested in truth because truth can be bent. Facts are different. Let me explain it. <laughs> If, if you and I were standing out on a corner and we witnessed a, a vehicle accident, the police come to you and say, make a statement, Esther. Your statement would be your truth. My statement would be my truth. The more statements you get, the closer you get to the facts. Oh, I understand you. So that the, the, the truth of the people here may be seen through their own eyes. It's but you're trying to get perception. what that they have exactly in common. It, yes. I understand. So I'm afraid our friend over there... As, uh, who's probably never seen an abduction victim, does not know what have he's you, talking Dr. about. Have you, Dr. Thompson, have you ever...? I've never seen someone who's been abducted or claimed to be abducted. Every single phenomenon which you get under hypnosis, you can reproduce by giving a medical student £20. <laughs> How can you argue with that, Esther? That's there's, a... there's people here who are suffering, and we have... People well, like you can our test doctor it, friend you over there, who's, who's ignoring no, it's the testable. evidence. And and just, no, does that the convince you? No. What, what is the point of us making it up? The, our experience was 14 years ago. Right. Would we really have gone through 14 years of being ridiculed by several people, newspapers, all, all types of people? Would we put ourselves through that if we didn't Esther. have There's something? It, all, it certainly sounds a bit arduous going through it all. I tell you what, Maria, I said we'd come back to your medical certificate, these injuries, because
let's face it, this is the nearest that we've got to independent corroboration of your experience, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So what we did was we telephoned the hospital that's named at the top of this form mm -hmm. to ask them about this form. Now, very sadly, they th said there were some errors in this form. They said that, for example, there was no date stamp on it and there's a special hospital stamp that they use. They said there should have been an admission time stamp on it and there isn't oh, one. They said there should be a, a time stamp for the time that you were discharged. They said that this signature doesn't actually conform to any doctor's signature who was there at the time that this happened to you. Yeah. And Excuse me. But, but, it's but, not but, a fake. But, but but what all they I also can tell said, you is, it was given, my, I was given a written letter to take to my GP, which yes. I took to my GP. And then afterwards, when I was asked to do a um, television uh, thing, which I did sort of anonymously, I asked my GP to fax me a copy of the later report that he received. And he sent me a faxed copy, and then I went down and he did a photocopy, and that is what he gave me. Well, the worst thing, I'm afraid, Maria, is that no doctor ever types a report like this. Well, all it I can say is that that's what was given to me by my general practitioner. They're always written by hand, do you see? Because doctors in casualty or these departments don't, don't have, have time. access to typewriters. Well, I just assumed that because I'd asked my doctor to get a report from the hospital of what was done, because I, I took to him down a brown envelope with a handwritten... Yes. And he, that was what he actually gave me. And, and your doctor is where? My doctor is in Dartford, but uh, he ha unfortunately had a heart attack. So, so he's, he's passed away? Yes, yeah, so I'm he? sure if we go through, if I went through my medical records, we could find, I mean, quite honestly, I mean, if, it, if I'm, I mean, would I go on live TV or, or TV in general with a fake medical report? You know, I, I asked my doctor to give me, excuse me. What do you think about I this? I went Hold to on. my doctor's and Hold he gave me a copy of the report. Yes. What's really what really baffles me is that out of the whole size of the whole planet, they come straight to your house. No, not just me, to many hundreds no, no, of people. No, no, I mean, in, in your area. I mean, exactly where do you live? On a, in, in a house in, in a village or in, in a city or a town? Just where? in a town, a normal house <laughs> in a normal town. Exactly. So, do you? so all the words are just flying across. And they said, oh, we'll go down there. Oh, how oh, wonderful. Let's all go down there, shall we? <laughs> all go down there, shall we? <laughs> Sir? Oh. What a load of rubbish. Esther, is oh. that yes. Yeah. Madam. Yeah. There's two things I want to say. When I was at school, I was told what man, what man can think of, man can do. And years and years and years ago, uh, man used to think they can fly. Today, we can. Years and years and years ago, man used to say, oh, we'll reach to the moon. Today, we can. Now, I want to say to people, how is it that we human beings on this Earth are making these fantastic space um, rockets going to different planets, and yet we do believe that we're so intelligent that nobody else out there is so intelligent they want to come here? Now, that's, that's actually a very good point. One of the most famous and respected scientists who's taken a great interest in alien encounters is, in fact, the author of 2001, A Space Odyssey. That's Arthur C. Clarke. He lives right now in Sri Lanka, but he's going to join us today from his home there. Dr. Clarke, do you believe in the existence of aliens? Yes, in fact, I've been interested in this for most of my life. I'm fairly sure that there's much life out in space and probably a great deal of intelligent life. And uh, this is one of the great, you know, mysteries. And why haven't they come here before? We've, we've started to go into space, so why has no one ever visited us? Have you any mental image of what they look like? No, because, uh, and they could be anything. Life on this planet is evolved in many in different shapes, and real aliens would be as strange to us as the giant squid, the giraffe, the sperm whale, and they wouldn't be in any way humanoid. And this is one reason, incidentally, why I don't take any of these reports of meeting with aliens seriously, because they're always humans. So you think that actually, if, if a human met an alien, they wouldn't recognize anything familiar in them? In fact, uh, I have on the t monitor behind me, if you can see it, uh, an impression of what an alien might be like. Uh, an ar a, a, a space artist has tried to give some idea of an alien entity. I don't know if you can focus on that, but it would be as strange as that. We wouldn't even know what it was, what it was. we couldn't understand it. Well, if there is life, if there is alien life out there somewhere in the universe, do you think they would take an interest in humans on Earth? 
Well, there again, there are so many possibilities. There may be hundreds of thousands or even millions of inhabited worlds with different life forms, different intelligence. So, uh, judging by the sample we have on this Earth, and admittedly one is not very good, <laughs> a very good sample, there must be, you'd think, other creatures who are, in, are curious, inquisitive about the universe, just as we are, and would start to explore it. Probably they wouldn't go in person. It, it's more likely they would send robot probes, which of course can travel for millions of years without getting tired. And is there any evidence of such robot probes? Has anybody found anything like that? And no, but this has been seriously proposed. In fact, that was one of the themes of 2001, the idea that there might, in the remote past, have been visitors who've left monitors, sort of watchmen, to watch over the Earth, and one day we may find them. And this has been taken up quite seriously. So perhaps somewhere out in the solar system, on the Moon, on Mars, or in orbit around the Sun, there may be monitors waiting for us to come out of the kindergarten, and then perhaps the, their creators may say, hi, here we are. Fascinating thought. Thank you for the moment, Dr. Clark. So he believes in alien life, but he doesn't believe in this sort of alien encounter. What do you say to that, man? Um, well, I believe it, obviously, because I've experienced it. I woke up in the early hours of the morning and found myself floating in a motel room above the bed to the side of it and then up out of the room. In a motel room? Yes, in America. Fine. Um, it wasn't an out-of-body experience. I saw the bed and my body wasn't in it. I was physically floating away from the bed. I then found myself lying on what felt like a metal sheet surrounded by lots of bright lights and lots of entities or beings that were not familiar to me. The feeling I got from them was very warm and very caring and very indulgent. So you enjoyed it? You weren't frightened? <laughs> I wasn't frightened, no. On that occasion, I wasn't frightened. And what do you think all that was? A hallucination, a dream? No, I believe it was real. Why? Because I didn't know what the beings looked like. I'd heard about the, the term alien abductions, but I didn't know what they looked like. And then when I had that experience, I described them to other people, and the description matched. I, I would like to ask Arthur C. Clarke, what might be some of the psychological explanations for the encounters that we hear about? Yes, this is a very interesting question. Why are people, so many people claiming to have seen the UFOs or encountered aliens, I think it's part of the psychopathology of our time, sort of maybe the fern de siècle phenomenon. You know, in earlier ages, people saw angels. Uh, uh, there were times when there were you know, thousands of people swore they saw angels or witches. We've been through various phases in the past, but it is now spaceship time. And of course, there have been so many films, TV programs, you can often identify the source of some of these uh, delusions. You can even recognize the spaceships and the aliens from, say, classic films like The Day the Earth, the Day the Earth Stood Still. But they don't, they're not very angelic these days, are they? They, they? they mess about with us a bit. Well, that again is a projection or interferes. Uh, uh, aliens, until fairly recently, in, well, I guess H.D. Wells started it. You know, when the aliens came here, they wanted to conquer us or even, or even eat us, they were hostile. But then um, Spielberg and others m made friendly aliens like E.T. So there's been a sort of oscillation between the two. And now, I mean, the ones we have heard about in the studio seem to be rather sort of primitive in what they're doing. There doesn't seem to be any vision in what they're doing. Is that just a reflection of our minds having lost some of our own vision? Yes, I mean, any account of an alien uh, abduction or encounter will depend on the psychology of the person concerned. You'd have to analyze you know, their background and find out why they had this particular delusion. I mean, that's the job of the psychologists. Isn't it dangerous, though, to discredit all of them and disbelieve all of them? We just might be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's so improbable that I don't give it a moment's thought. But remember, too, that there are radar networks, optical networks, scanning the sky. They've been doing this for years now because of the danger of missile attacks. Anything that came to Earth, it would be detected very, very quickly. Right, thank you very much indeed. I know of pilots well, who have been ordered to shoot them down. Asterisk. Harry Harris. Yes, I have I've met a number of pilots who were scrambled um, yes. and ordered to shoot yes. UFOs down, to fire on them. One, of the, one, in fact, is an American professor of industrial engineering at Florida International University. But you've heard what Arthur C. Clarke says. Well, I think, you know, with respect to Arthur C. Clarke, he could be wrong. Now, uh, he's clearly not aware, he can't be aware, 
of the radar visual sightings. There were some in Belgium. I have personally interviewed a Professor Schweitzer regarding his research on a Belgian sighting in 1990, multi-radar visual. Would you have this sort of explanation? This planet has been contacted by the superior, we would call them the cosmic masters in the Ethereum Society. They have been contacting this planet right the way throughout our recorded Are history. Are you saying these people they with skinny have legs? Been they have been they have been accounted for in all of our religious works. Is We're that talking a cosmic about Jesus, Buddha, Sh oh. Sri Krishna, oh. I Ching, Confucius. <laughs> They're all cosmic masters who have come to this planet. Well, let me put that to Arthur C. Clarke. Do you believe that? Well, that of course was the idea behind 2001. I don't uh, intend that to be taken seriously, but uh, the theme of the movie was the interaction of aliens you know, in the remote past. Uh, turning us, in a sense, from the man-apes at the beginning of the film into the ape-men later on. Uh, it's possible, but I think rather unlikely. So you don't think the pyramids are actually have been placed there by aliens centuries and centuries ago to... What utter nonsense. We know exactly how the pyramids were built. We know who built them. We know the name of the architects. I and mean, what utter raving rubbish. Why do people think that we're so stupid? It's very sad because it, it's such, in 2001, it's such a marvellous, persuasive sort of myth for us to hang on to. It's a pity to, for us to have to dump it. Well, in a way, I'm sorry I've created that myth because perhaps too many people have taken it seriously. Oh, Anne Baring, what do you say to that? I think we're a very rational culture, not given to visions, or at least not given to accepting them. So it seems to me this is the only acceptable form of vision that we allow ourselves. And the audience here is very much divided. Um, <coughs> half the audience wants to believe or does believe, and the other half categorically doesn't want to and says it's rubbish, so to speak. I would feel as a, as a Jungian that there's a split in the culture between our rational conscious self and our instinctual selves, which we know absolutely nothing whatsoever about. And we have no God image at the moment. So where do we find God now? We find angels and we find the gods in this UFO situation. So it's the same that, that humanity has been doing since yes, time began. since time began. We need this. We, we all need something to... We're creating our own myths. Yeah, we're creating a myth. But the myth is part of our, the evolution of our own consciousness. We need the myth in order to evolve. So it's not something rubbishy. It's, it's vitally important that we understand what the myth is saying to us. Yeah, I'd like to make one other comment. Um, I hope that in my lifetime we may receive some signal which indicates that there is something out there. That seems the only likely way we will discover the existence of alien intelligence. What would that mean to you? Well, it would indicate that intelligence is not unique. It would also indicate that intelligence has some survival value. When you look at the evening TV news, one wonder of, <laughs> you can't help wondering about that sometimes. Well, let's hope in your lifetime we do have some sort of evidence because, as you say, for everybody, I think, on Earth, it would be the most exciting and extraordinary discovery. Thank you very much indeed, Arthur C. Clarke in Sri Lanka. Thank you. I've enjoyed talking to you. I'm afraid that is all we have time for. Thank you so much for sharing all your experiences with us. Thank you. A special thank you to Arthur C. Clarke for joining us from Sri Lanka. Thank you for joining us at home or wherever else you are watching us from. Till next time, goodbye. More of the best of Esther next Saturday at the slightly earlier time of 10 past four.